good evening to everyone and welcome to today's session today we shall have a review of uh, three main topics in neuroanatomy which include spinal cord the various tracts of the spinal cord and the lesions of the spinal cord are the main focus so in our earlier session we had a review of circulation of the brain and uh, the structure of the neurology both the brain and spinal cord we have reviewed in our earlier sessions now let us finish up with spinal cord today so that from tomorrow we go to the brain stem basal ganglia etc etc so we welcome our online students dr kavi akshara rohit neena tirupati and the students of guntur i am very happy are all online and dr sudham so doctor spinal cord it weighs about 30 grams and it constitutes about 2% of the weight of the adult brain as you already know very well what is the weight of the adult brain how much csf is produced everything we discussed in the last session more than the weight spinal cord need to be remembered for its length which is the favorite question of the examiner 45 cm in males 42 cm in females is the typical length of the spinal cord and uh, it typically extends in the adults all the way from foramen magnum up to the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra in the case of the neonates what is the length of the spinal cord until where does it extend is one of the commonly asked question which you have to be 100% sure doctor in case of the newborn it extends until third lumbar vertebrae l3 whereas in the case of the adults it extends up to the first lumbar vertebra the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra until there it will be extending is what i want to underscore to all of you so it typically lies in the subarachnoid space and it extends um if you take the subarachnoid space the subarachnoid space extends a little more down so the subarachnoid space will extend until the second sacral vertebra but the spinal cord will stop at the level of lower part of the l1 is what need to be remembered now our upper limbs are bringing a lot of fibers into the spinal cord so that is the reason there is a cervical enlargement between c5 to t1 our lower limbs are bringing a lot of motor ascending and descending fibers so that is the reason there is another enlargement in the lumbar level typically at the level of uh, L1 to S2 is what need to be basically remembered. So these two are called brachial and lumbosacral plexuses associated enlargements. Ultimately, the spinal cord will be tapering down, and it will be forming what is called as conus medullaris. Is what I want to tell you now. How many nerves are exiting? the spinal cord there are totally 31 pairs of nerves eight cervical 12 thoracic five lumbar five sacral and one coccygeal nerve is the one which is exiting the spinal cord this number is very important because uh, examiner's uh, favorite question is uh, how many spinal nerves in thoracic area lumbar area and sacral and coccygeal area you need to be 100% sure then both if you look at the spinal uh, nerves they contain both the motor and also the sensory fibers is what you have to remember they are a mixed nerve now here there are few exceptions if you take the first cervical nerve and if you take the coccygeal nerve these two have no sensory roots they only have motor component no sensory roots hence there are no dermatomes corresponding to the first cervical and the coccygeal nerve 
spinal nerve is what you have to ultimately remember. Between the skull and the atlas, the first cervical nerve will be passing. The second will be passing between atlas and axis. And uh, with the exception of the first cervical, all the spinal nerves will either exit through the intervertebral foramina or through the sacral foramina. That's the ultimate fate. If you take the lower uh, spinal cord segments, their spinal nerves will be coming out and forming a cord equina. And ultimately they will be exiting out through the sacral foramina is what I want to underscore to all of you. Now, what are the various functional components of the uh, spinal nerve fibers? Typically, they contain general somatic afferents. What does it mean, doctor? From our skin, whatever the sensation is coming. From the muscle movements, whatever the movement of the muscles is happening, all the tendon organs will be informing the brain and uh, all that information will pass through spinal nerve. So, that information is the part of the general somatic afferent. Similarly, from the joints also, all the proprioceptive information comes under general somatic afferent. Then general visceral afferent, all the sensory input which is coming from the viscera, abdominal and thoracic viscera. Then general somatic efferent, that is the alpha motor neurons will ultimately go and innervate the skeletal muscle fibers, no? So androhonsels will be giving rise to the alpha motor neurons which will go and innervate the skeletal muscle fibers. So that constitutes the general somatic efferent component is what I want to underscore. Then we have the general visceral efferent which is exiting the uh, spinal cord which is part of the spinal nerve. Now what is this general visceral efferent fiber? See we are having uh, visceral organs, smooth muscle, the glands, they are all innervated ultimately by the motor output which goes from the intermediolateral cell column of the spinal cord. So those neurons typically are the general visceral efferent fibers of the spinal nerves. So ultimately the sacral parasympathetic areas, they go to the pelvic viscera via the intramural ganglions and uh, they carry this general visceral efferent and ultimately the detrusor in the bladder contracts and we maturate. So how is it possible? There is a sacral plexus which is there in the spinal cord. And that sacral plexus will be giving rise to this general visceral efferent which will go and lead to the detrusor contraction. So where is this autonomic efferent output is located in the spinal cord? There is an area which is called intermediolateral cell column. The neurons of this intermediolateral cell column will give rise to general visceral efferents is what need to be remembered. Now let us look at one of the spinal nerves. How it looks like? There is one dorsal root, there is a ventral root. Within the intervertebral foramina, they both will be fusing and ultimately they will be forming the spinal nerve which is a mixed nerve. Now if you look at this dorsal root, typically it enters the dorsal lateral sulcus, this is called as, this area. So it enters to the dorsal lateral sulcus through the dorsal rootlet and it conveys the sensory information from the body. Then this dorsal root also contains a small part which is uh, little swollen, right? which is called dorsal ganglion. Typically, distal to this dorsal ganglion, the dorsal root will be merging with the ventral root. There is no such ganglion in the ventral root. Only there is a ganglion for the dorsal root. Once more to re enunciate the same, we have one ventral root which is the efferent and there is one dorsal root which is an afferent. And dorsal root also is having a dorsal root ganglion. Then, what are the type of neurons which are there in this dorsal root ganglion is an important question. 
Typically, this dorsal root ganglion contains pseudo-unipolar neurons. This is one of the common questions in the exam. Which type of neurons are located in which parts of the nervous system? We need to be doubly sure. So, there is a pseudo-unipolar neuron which is of a neural crest origin which is located in the dorsal root ganglion and it is the one which is basically carrying the general somatic and visceral afferents to the spinal cord through the dorsal roots is what you need to ultimately remember. Now, what is ventral root? Ventral root is the motor root, motor output, which will ultimately go to the visceral and somatic motor neurons. So basically, the ventral root will be joining the dorsal root, distal to the dorsal root ganglion and uh, this typically happens within the intervertebral foramen and uh, it forms the spinal nerve. So this is all the structure of ventral root, dorsal root, what is the importance of pseudo unipolar neurons. That is the buzzword you need to catch up with reference to the dorsal root. Ganglion is what need to be remembered. Please give the doctors uh, the notes of the today's class. Hmm? Everybody. Now, what is carda equina? Typically, the lumbosacral area may, the lumbosacral motor ventral roots are there, no? They are all merged together from the second lumbar until coccygeal. All of them merged together to form this cauda equina. So typically the spinal cord is ending at the level of the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra. Below that you have this cauda equina fibers which are basically coming out. Right? Now, um, this cauda equina typically will be descending from the spinal cord to the subarachnoid space to ultimately come out to the foramina which are located in the sacral vertebra, intervertebral sacral foramina, it will be coming out. So that is all the story of cauda equina. Now there are two kinds of compression of the spinal cord which can occur. One kind of compression can be directly on to the spinal cord itself. Then what will happen? The spinal cord get compressed and also the androhorn cells also get compressed. But if the compression or any mass lesion is located typically in the sacral area and if it is compressing, what is it compressing? It is not compressing the pyramidal tract fibers, corticospinal tract fibers it is not compressing because corticospinal tract fibers are only located in spinal cord. They are not there in the cauda equina. Cauda equina only is having the narrow fibers, the narrow rootlets to be precise. Hence, what kind of lesion is a cauda equina, lower motor neuron type or UMN type? Lower motor neuron type. Then as conus medullaris, that there is a compression of the conus of the cord, it compresses both the corticospinal tract descending fibers of the pyramidal tract and also it will compress the androhorn cells. So, since both of them are involved, you get both LM and UMN type of features. In the case of the conus medullaris is what I want to underscore to all of you. Now, doctor, if you look at this spinal nerve, you have seen that it has got rootlets. Ventral root, dorsal root, dorsal root ganglion, etc, etc. Now, the spinal nerve also has got remi. So, what are the spinal nerve remi? This is little dry part of uh, entire neuroanatomy. After this, we will be talking tracts, descending, ascending tracts. After that, we talk lesions of the descending, ascending tracts. So, just bear with me for a little more time. After that, uh, we will go to the more interesting part. But this is more easy to remember. Then, we have a dorsal primary ramus, ventral primary ramus, Dorsal always is what? Afferent, no? So, it innervates the skin and muscles of the back. Ventral primary ramus innervates the ventrolateral muscles and the skin of the trunk extremities and visceral organs. Then meningeal ramus innervates the meninges and the vertebral column. So, these are the three different types of the rami. Then there is one great ramus communicantis and white ramus communicantis. 
which you need to know when it comes to the remi of the spinal nerves. Typically, a grey remi communicant is basically contains autonomic nerve fibers, unmyelinated postganglionic autonomic. Typically, sympathetic fibers are located in this grey remi communicant. And every spinal nerve will have a part of it, not only sensory and motor, autonomic component also. Hence, every spinal nerve will have this sympathetic grey remi communicant. Mainly, examiner likes to know what is the constitution of this grey remi communicant. What is your answer, doctor? Typically, it has got unmyelinated postganglionic sympathetic fibers. That's what you need to remember. White remi communicantus typically has got myelinated preganglionic sympathetic fibers and also myelinated general visceral afferents. Suppose if the bladder is stretched, then that that stretch feeling need to be communicated to the spinal cord. No? So it is a viscera. It's a visceral afferent. So the general visceral afferent fibers which are coming from the splanconic nerve plexuses, they are also traveling through white remi communicantes. So where do we have this white remi communicanti? Only in the spinal nerves, in the thoracolumbar segments of the spinal cord only you have the white remi communicanti is what need to be basically remembered. So that's all the story. We have buried uh, spinal cord behind. Now what is there in the internal morphology of the spinal cord? 